Alabama. Uh, with the sponsoring church there is the Shiloh Church in Hazel Green, Alabama. And he is going to speak with us for this class period, and then he's going to bring the lesson this morning, the sermon this morning. Uh, and he, his main concern with us this morning, he's going to talk about evangelism. And the idea of the uh, uh, India work is going to be in the background there, but it's always going to be, uh, I'm sure, uh, part of his attention full time. So we're going to turn the uh, we're going to turn the microphone over to Brother Ron. And just to let you know uh, we are streaming live. So not only do we get to get the benefit of the lesson this morning, but everyone who is going to be tuning in uh, via the internet is going to get it uh, and take advantage of it as well. So we're going to turn it back over to Brother Ron. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, that's good. I said, oh, you're out there and alive. Okay. This morning, we're going to show you some slides quickly. And I'm going to tell you a few things about India quickly. And after that, we're going to tell you why the work works like it is or does. And that's why we're going to have to have a little extra time. Did everybody get their ticket to get in? Did you get a ticket, ma'am? Uh-oh. When you ride the train in India, there's a sign in every bogey. That means the car. And it says, ticketless passengers shall be ejected from the train. And then there's an asterisk, and it says, while it's still moving. So I don't want you thrown off the train. <laughs> okay. India is a big country. Did you get one of these, brother? Okay. India is a big country, and it is, a, it is and unique, if that's a prep, right way to say it, the most unique country in the world today, religiously, and a number of other ways. Hinduism is a the religion of India, and consequently we have uh, a, a very different set of rules. India is the world's largest democracy, seventh largest country in the world by land area, second largest by population. India has 1.27 billion people, and if you put India and China together, that's at least 40% of the world's population, or pretty close to it. India is about 2,000 miles long, 1,850 miles across. You're, you are the first congregation to get my new handout. So everybody be happy with that, please. Everybody say, happy. There you go. This uh, has in, made some changes, including, which the map has not. This part of this state has been cut off, unfortunately, and is now called Telangana. So we have two Telugu-speaking states instead of one, as was originally plan. These are linguistically divided states, and so you have a multiplicity of languages. There are two national languages, Hindi and English, 15 major languages in the country, 25 in actuality, and the government of India recognizes 845 different languages and dialects. Unofficially, over 1,600. So, Brother Preacher, when you preach on the Tower of Babel, I know where it was. It's in here somewhere. This is a real mess, and uh, uh, to give you a very quick idea of what that means, in Kashmir, they speak Kashmiri, Punjab, Punjabi, Rajasthan, Rajasthani, Gujarat, Gujarati. Now, Sister Sybil, I want to see how smart you are. What would they speak in Kerala? That's pretty good, Keralati, that's a good guess. My favorite answer at all time was South Carolinian. I was in South Carolina when I asked the question. They speak Malayalam. Malayalam. These languages up here are Indo-European. These down here are Dravidian, two families of languages. Okay? And very quickly, I'm going to let you hear how some of these sound. Now, I'm going to say, hello. How are you? I'm fine. I am not fluent in all of these. But I have found out, not even close, but I have found out if you can greet someone in their native tongue because you're a foreigner, especially an American, oh, they just, oh, that's the greatest thing you could do. So, here we go. Kashmiri. Namaste. Vare Kushput. It's kind of like someone from New York. Okay? Uh, Punjab. Punjabi. Namaste. Sat Shri Akal. Metiktakanji. In Gujarat. Namaste. Kemcho Saruche. So that's, see, those are different languages. What's a dialect? Now, in Georgia, y'all speak Georgian. That's spelled J-A-W-J-A, -A, right? Georgia. And in Alabama, we speak Southern by the grace of God, y'all. 
And I am a Texican, so we speak Texican. But if you're from New York City, you speak Yankee, but it's still what? English. See, those are the dialects. The language is English. These are languages, not dialects. Maharashtra, they speak Marathi. Namaskar, tu me kaseahat, badahai. Down here, you get into the Dravidian. Karnataka, Canada. That's with a K and a double N. Namaskara, Chanagidara, Chanagi. Hear the difference? In Tamil Nadu, Tamil. Wanakam, Salkamya, Salkim. Andhra Pradesh and in Telangana, they speak Telugu. Namaskaram, Baganara, Baguna. I think it's the prettiest language in India. It is called the Italian of the East. Up here in West Bengal, they speak Bengali. Nomoskar, Apni Kamunachen, Baluachen. Bengali, by the way, is the fifth or sixth most widely spoken language in the world. And I didn't know that till a few years ago. And Hindi is the thing that ties them together. And that's spoken by about 40 to 50 percent of the people of India. And Hindi says, Namaste, Ap Kaisahe. And the answer is, if you're okay, TK. If you're fine, Achahe. If you're very fine, Bahotache. So that's a little bit about the languages. Now, uh, Karen, well, let's see. Can I get you to do this, Chuck? This brother over here did not get one, and there may be some others. And if you'll catch anybody coming in, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. You had an extra? Oh, you can't do that. You have to have your own ticket to get in. If you have both one, get another one later. That's okay. But I would like for you to mail one to a friend, really. You paid, but he didn't pay. <laughs> okay. Anyhow. Uh, India is the home to the greatest mission field in the world. There's nothing that even comes close. I am not putting down any other mission work or missionary. I'm just telling you in terms of people, receptivity, those who are obeying the gospel, interest, all of that. There's not even a, it's not even a comparison. And I'll tell you why, more, uh, why that is true more a little bit later on. All right, so... Right now, we are going to show some slides. If we can get the lights out, Mr. Dan, and my lovely assistant here, who's sitting on the wrong side. Okay. This is forward, yeah. Okay. Can you get these out, too? There we go. There. All right. And the adjustment's up at the front, Karen. You may need to. Taj Mahal. Not a palace, not a temple. Not a, uh, what you think it is. It's a mausoleum. And this is where Shah Jahan's 14th wife, Mumtaz, is buried. And it took 22 years to build at ex great, great expense. And uh, these were Muslims. And so part of their building situation is everything has to be symmetrical. I'll sit here and help you. Next. The artwork inside and out, precious and semi-precious stones that have been inlaid into that marble, and that one flower alone has about 44 separate pieces. And I don't mean the, the leaves from it, I mean just the flower. And this is throughout the Taj Mahal. Okay. The Palace of the Winds is in Jaipur, which is not too far from Agra. Agra is the place where the Taj Mahal is located. And uh, Jaipur is one of my favorite places in India, certainly Rajasthan is. And this is the Palace of the Winds. This is where the king and his family would sit. And it served as an air conditioning system. And because the, these are just little cubicles about four or five feet deep. The Charminar is in Hyderabad. And Char means four, Minar means tower. And this was an old Muslim mosque that has been closed now. Too many people went up there and jumped down to commit suicide. So they closed that off. And then from uh, okay, and then from across the street is the uh, you can see from the towers one of the largest I've heard the seventh largest Muslim mosque in the world. Lots of Muslims in this city of of about 15 million people in the greater metro area. In Bombay, <clears throat> they drive as they do throughout India on the wrong side of the road. They're quite British, don't you know? And someone recently said the old double-decker buses that die in London are reincarnated in Bombay, and that's probably true. This is a very small part of Queen Victoria Station, Victoria Terminus, a railway station that reflects the British Raj in India, the British rule. And this was probably built somewhere about the 1850s or so, and uh, very Gothic style. 
that's Queen Victoria statue in the white. You remember that she ruled for about 50 years or so, and uh, the uh, the sun never set on the British Empire, and that's really true. And this is beautiful downtown Bombay. Now this is not. Uh, you have to understand things have improved a lot, but the problem when you have when you're poor, things like being clean are not as important as getting a meal for your family. So. Uh, filth, disease, squalor, poverty, misery go hand in hand in a vicious cycle in India. <coughs> and this is the village. This is the real village. This is the real India. About 60% of India's people still live in villages, maybe more than that. And uh, that's where Mahatma Gandhi said the real India is. Okay. And uh, this is how uh, people have to live in some cases. They're not camping out. That's all they've got. Now, if you want to know about poverty, that's it. And this particular hut is bigger than most in a village. Uh, the parents sleep on that little cot out front there, and children sleep on straw mats they put out on the floor at night, and you eat from those same mats. Those are water buffalo, if you've never seen them, in the foreground. And uh, about still about 10% of the villages of India do not even have electricity because they're very remote. And there's no running water, no bathtub, no showers in the in the villages. Life in a village is like camping out for the rest of your life. The woman at the well came to life for me from John chapter 4 because that's still how they get their water. And it becomes a social center. You visit with your friends and so on. Okay. And uh, here's how they carry the water. Ladies, guess whose work it is. And uh, they over the shoulder, from the left arm to the right shoulder, and... Uh, Sometimes you have to go some distance to get to the well. The, this is an Indian superhighway. It used to be. <laughs> it's got two lanes. Uh, at one time, 65% of all the Indian highways were one-laners. So with, that meant you drove right at each other. When you got close, slow down, get your outside tires off the road, pray the other guy does the same thing, pass each other, and get back up on the road and go on your way. From 1990 through the year 2010, India built... Ten times as many roads as they had from independence in 1947 through 1999. So they've made tremendous progress. But it's always easier to move sheep and goats and animals and of all kinds on the roads. And if there's ever a water buffalo near nearby, uh, you have to be very careful because they will have been known to go off the road and for no apparent reason do a 180 and get back up on the road. And so Indians are very wary of those and they call them two things. They call them brake inspectors and speed bumps. Okay. Cows are everywhere. Holy cow! That's where it came from. Uh, the cow is sacred in India, not really worship, but uh, they're everywhere. This is a meeting place of a congregation many, many years ago and uh, she's got her little territory staked out and goes there every day for a handout of food. <clears throat> Snake charmers are real, the snakes are real, and that's where reality ceases. These are cobras, but they have been defanged, so they can't hurt you. Uh, number two, it, he'll take his basket and shake it up and take the lid off, and the snakes come up, and they're angry. And so he'll start playing his flute, and they go back and forth, and everybody says, oh, they're dancing to the mute. No, snakes are deaf. All snakes are deaf, and they're just following the movement of the flute. So it's a good show, but that's all it is. <clears throat> and these are little sweethearts on their way to school. Uh, <clears throat> you see the skin tone here. It will be very, very black to very, very light, everything in between. And these girls are, I think, Muslims uh, on their way to school. Dress style has changed some. That was the old style Punjabi that they wore. But anyhow, they're very attractive people and very kind and sweet people. Uh, this was a Muslim in their beautiful garb called a burqa. You wear beautiful clothing and then you put this black thing on it. You look like, who was that guy on? <laughs> sort of. Uh, who? Adam's family? It? Whatever. Like it. Okay, here we go. Next. <clears throat> and these are girls who are Hindu or Christian backgrounds on the way to school. Notice the long blouse below the skirt, uh, the waist rather, the long skirt that goes to the top of their shoes and their hair will be in two braids and most of them have their slates that they take to school as well as their books. And, and uh, that's very common. Now, when they become mature women, they will wear the sari. This is Karen. This picture was taken years ago in Bangalore. And frankly, I don't know anybody wore the sari any better than Karen did. And in fact, she taught our Indian daughter-in-law how to wear one properly. How about that? 
So anyhow, ladies, if you're four six and weigh seventy five pounds, or if you're six five and weigh two fifty, you just wrap, wrap, wrap. It's about six meters of material. You get the blouse to fit you, and the rest of it is uh, done that way. I just told you. I think when it's worn right, it's the most elegant, graceful, feminine, and lovely thing a woman can wear. When it's worn wrong, it's an entirely different matter. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> this is traditional Indian trousers for the men. This is called the dhoti. It's kind of a gauzy type material like the old diapers used to be, and you wrap it around in between your legs, and it's only worn right when one leg is so much longer than the other that if you don't hold it in your hand, you'll trip on your face. And Chuck, I have one just for you, brother. Don't thank me. I'm glad to do it. Okay. And uh, in the northeast and northwest of the country, they wear a lot of big nose rings. And uh, uh, you see all the jewelry, and that's their wealth. So when they need a loan or whatever, they can take their jewelry off, take it to the money lender. And it's also sort of like a life insurance policy. If you see that red dot, it's kind of faded. Uh, that's a Botu Tilak or Bindi. Only Hindus wear those, and uh, Christians do not. Okay. Lombardi people are very different. They're tribal people, very independent, hardworking. Those earrings tied to the hair next to the ear because they'd pull your ears right off. And she has a lot of bangles on her own made out of camel bone. Uh, her blouse is covers the front, has no back to it, and ties at the waist, and has lots of people, pieces of glass or of uh, mirror in it, and she's got a skirt on, kind of looks like a patchwork quilt, doesn't it? And then she's got this wraparound, and that's what the Lombardis wear. Now, those are Lombardi men, and if you can see their, their turbans, their turbans are different than turbans in other part of the country. You have to get used to this. Okay. Oh, oh, I'll go back. I forgot one little thing. If you look at her toes, on her big toe is a ring. That's for decoration. That's a Lombardi thing. But on the second toe of both feet, she has become Indianized enough to wear that like all other Indian women. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? I mean, she's a married woman. You wear wedding rings on your toes. I thought anybody knew that. Okay. And here's an albino child, the first one I've ever seen. Look at the facial features. Look at the skin color. This is a small village in South India. And as an American, I was really an oddity over there. So they just all had to come see me. Okay. And this little girl's on her way to school. And notice her slate. And uh, they, uh, they're quite British, don't you know? So they, they do a lot of things the British way. And what would, do I usually say here? Is this the one about the... Well, we'll just pass on that. We'll come to something else. Now, this is a Sikh. Now, not all Sikhs dress like this. This man works for a hotel or a fancy restaurant. But notice his turban. Now, that turban's different than the one you saw a while ago. They always have something in the front there, a different color. That covers his hair directly. It's a, like a cap, a sock. And then he puts this turban on over that. Sikhs are part Hindu and part Muslim in their faith. When it comes to problems between a Hindu and a Muslim, they will always side with the Hindus, but they're interesting people. And he never cuts his beard, never sh uh, cuts his hair. This was Karen's, one of Karen's favorite characters. He played this homemade whatever this is, and he's Rajasthani. Now, that's a different kind of turban. They like red, green, yellow, and black. And, oh, he could play that thing, and you can tell by the way he played it, he just loved to play uh, his little homemade fiddle or whatever that would be called. Okay. This is in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, this is a semi-arid tropical setting and uh, this is what you find much in what we call the Deccan Plateau, south of the Gangetic Plain and inland from the, the uh, coastal area and it's a lot like parts of New Mexico and Arizona and, and uh, West Texas and Southern California. All right. And rice grows everywhere. That's what that green stuff is. Notice the foreground. You put water to any kind of dirt at all, and it will grow rice, and that's what they've got. And they eat it three times a day, yum, yum. Okay? We go by train all we can. Trains are not exactly what you would experience on Amtrak. <laughs> First class ain't. But, but anyhow, it's a whole lot better than going by car. More people die in car wrecks every year in India than any other country in the year, world. So we 
we like to go by train every time we can, and millions and millions and millions of people travel by train every year. Uh, these are auto rickshaws. It's a cheap taxi. It's kind of like a golf cart with a back seat. And this is Raj Kumar's record service. That's as good as it gets, okay? And trolleys are used to carry heavy loads for short distances in the big cities. Those, that little trailer is carrying a bunch of Bibles in boxes. They don't box them up like that anymore. And we gave those away free of charge. And we've done that many, many times since. Uh, this is a type of bicycle rickshaw, the most unusual. This is found in what is called coastal Andhra. And I know that all of you know this, but that says VJ Rickshaw. Okay? Anybody know what this is? This is one of my favorite pictures. You know what this is? It's a school bus. Cage the critters up. I think they're on to something here. Okay? And this is the last bus out of the village. Anytime you don't have to walk is good, so they're on top. And that, that was the first car I ever used in India, APQ8362. I knew that. And that was from Andhra Pradesh, Karnul District, and Mr. Saleem was my driver for a long time. Okay. Elephants are found in abundance in many places, but especially up in the desert in Jaipur because they serve as a way to get up to the fort uh, down, down that way. And so you see them quite often in, in Jaipur in freeway traffic. And uh, they are big critters, but they're not nearly as big as the African variety. And I was surprised. I was ready for, you know, uh, uh, tigers and, and elephants and cobras. But now I found out that there were uh, <clears throat> lions and tigers and bears and camels too. Oh, my. And they're pretty big. You see how this man's over six feet tall. And that's a big, big animal, and really that's not the biggest camel you'll find. But they are huge, and they're used for all kinds of stuff. Some of them still run wild in the deserts up there. And uh, these are gospel chariots, not bicycles. We buy these for preachers and give them to do the Lord's work, when they, especially in the villages, where they go to two or three congregations every Sunday. This is your local uh, uh, tea stall. This is not Shoney's, <laughs> as you can tell. And... Uh, I don't eat or drink anything out of there because such things as tuberculosis and, and dysentery are on the uh, menu, and I just I don't want that. Straight side barber, you can get your underarm shaved. Different culture, folks. Wash day at the Washateria, downtown Bombay. I've been by this several times. And they pick out a stall of water, get their clothes wet, take a blue bar of laundry soap, rub it in their clothes, rub their clothes together, and then beat the daylights out of them on the concrete. That's your agitator. If they have buttons on their shirts, they won't. This is how they do it at the riverside. On the rocks in India means doing your laundry, and they, they, when they get through, they put it on the ground to dry. When it's dry, they shake the dirt out. Makes sense to me. Okay? Here's your local 7-Eleven store, and that's as good as they get. And uh, no ice cream in there, folks, because there's nothing refrigerated, and she's got one little light bulb, and that's it. And that may be the only one in town. These are not apples or cranberries or strawberries. They are red chili peppers. Everything you eat in India is hot. About three alarms worth. It will clear your sinuses and your conscience at the same time, Brother Chuck. Okay? Beautiful little baby. The tragedy of India, 76,000 babies are born every single day. And they have cut their birth rate. When you consider how many people they've got, they used to have about double that many or would have. This is a Hindu holy man. He's wearing the color called saffron, which has many shades, but it's a basically an orange to orangish red. And he goes around door to door begging for a handout because he spends his life meditating and praying. And every good Hindu family will have this kind of artwork in honor to its deities. That's what you see here. And this is a Hindu chariot. They use this in special festival seasons. And uh, they put their idols in there and carry them around, throw these garlands of flowers on them and all this botu powder that, like the woman had on her forehead. And this is a Hindu temple. And it's uh, pretty old. It's a lot older than our country. It's over a thousand years old. And all those carvings are different so-called Hindu deities. Hinduism allows up to 350 million different gods and goddesses. Okay? And... This brother's sitting on a stack of 40,000 New Testaments that we just bought. 
we distributed those and we replaced them with 40,000 more and then we distributed those. So we're getting the Word of God in the printed page, the Word of God to people. This is the first church building in Markapur that I ever helped to build and we have remodeled it and since that time this is an older picture but this is the children's home that we built there and that's our little apartment there kind of on the in between the first and second floor and uh, that's where we stay when we go there. We have over 1600 Kate K Memorial Bible Institutes, one day a week preacher training schools. This is a branch of that school, all of them being taught by Indian brethren. We had a school in Hyderabad. This will just uh, be a picture to show you the basic crowded conditions of schools over there. We have replaced it with another one called Kiran's, K-I-R-A-N, apostrophe S, Kiran's Kids, in another section of the city. Okay? This is my oldest son, Jeff, and his wife. They made a trip years ago, and uh, Karen Sue, Jeff's made about five trips to India. Karen Sue has uh, made one, and she did great. She helped with vacation, Bible school, and other things. She's a trooper. This is our youngest son, Kyle, who went to India in 1993. Dad, I will stay two months only. Do not try to find me a sweet little Indian girl to marry. Ha! He's been there 20 years. He's married, got three kids. So anyhow, and he's become a very, very good preacher and teacher. And this is him teaching, preaching a sermon with a translator, okay? That brother's name was B. Isaac Prabhakar. This is his wife, Sony. Sony is a beautiful girl and has just been a great, great blessing for Kyle's life. And this is Sunshine when she was small. Sunshine's now 18. She will be Miss India in three years. She is drop-dead gorgeous. Of course, Papa thinks that. Okay. And that's her little brother, Jordan, who's now 13. Jordan, I told Karen, 15, I'm sorry. I told Karen when he was two and a half, you better flash fry, freeze him in time because he is perfect. And he was. He was a wonderful kid. Okay, that's sunshine again. This is a place where we went. We baptized 92, one day, one place. 20 years of work went into that. Okay, don't have time to go into all the details. 77 were baptized here. These were denominational people. The others had been Hindus. And... Uh, this was done uh, in a meeting after they'd been taught for about a year, and it was payoff time. This is how people meet in India, folks. Men on the front one side, women on the other, kids up front, basically. And no pews, no padded pews, no air conditioning, no carpet. And they're glad to have a building. And I'm going to tell you, most of the time, those buildings are pretty full. Okay. This man was about to be baptized after a gospel meeting that I preached and the man that's baptizing him was a leprosy doctor and uh, here was the confession that he was making. Yesu Christu Devani Kumaradu Ani Nenu Namu Chunanu In Telugu, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Sometimes the water was so shallow we'd have to dig out from a sandy bottom creek, put people in a sitting position, one man holds the feet under, the other does the baptizing, as you see here. This poor little lady is one of uh, about 25 million in India. She's blind. She has no son to take care of her. She's a widow, and so she's on the streets, and she's skin and bones, and uh, she has to live on what people give her. And this is a real tragedy in India. This man lost uh, the use of his legs because of polio. He's a gospel preacher. We bought him a three-wheel bicycle that he could crank with his hands to get to his gospel meetings. We've lost touch with him years ago, but... But uh, that's all he asks. I, I just need one of those tricycles, I guess you'd call it. This man has elephantitis, both legs. This is one of the most horrible things that you'll encounter in India. And it's caused by a parasite, I suppose, that comes through mosquitoes. And uh, I just, every time I see this, I think about how filthy sin is in the sight of God, how ugly it is. That's a good parallel. This is a man with leprosy on the streets. We see them every day. His head, face is covered for reasons best left undescribed. He has a teenage boy across his lap who is not only paralyzed but also a leper. God sees sin like we see a leper. We need to see as God sees. Last picture. I hope it's dark enough in here. You can't see that very well, but this man sitting there, I was leaving an underground shopping center in Delhi as we're about to leave the country and there he sat, and he'd lost all of his fingers and all of his toes, and his nose was pushed in and so on. And all of that has to do with leprosy. And uh, I prayed for him and gave him some money. 
nothing else I could do. And uh, got home, and I had a preacher buddy say, Ron, I've got a great idea to help you raise money for your work in India. And I said, well, what is it? And he says, this, here's a sermon. Looking into the eyes of the damned. I said, Charlie, I saw that sermon in New Delhi. I've never seen such hopelessness or despair in anybody's eyes in all my life as that man. So we need to, to remember, that's the spiritual lesson. God sees a sinner like we see a leopard. Okay, and I remembered what I was going to tell you about that girl. Let me move this up so we can take it out. In India, we have a... Dan, can we have the lights, please? In India, we have uh, the problem of things being pronounced in a British way. I was preaching in a meeting one night, and uh, about, I was uh, about halfway through my sermon, this guy jumped up and started jabbering away in Telugu. And uh, I didn't know what to think. My translator said, Brother, pay him no mind. He's a lunatic. I said, what? He's a lunatic. I said, he said, mental. I said, oh, you mean a lunatic. And he looked me right in the face and so at me he said, what? Now, when you drive a car, it is, it is not the hood of the car. It's the bonnet. It's not the trunk. It's the boot. When the car is sick, you take it to the garage or the garage. Garage, not the uh, uh, garage or garage. And you, uh, you, don't pour, you don't fill gasoline at the gas station. You pour petrol at the petrol bunk. See, one guy came to me, one preacher, and he was all upset, and he was talking about this brother who had problems, and, and he said, he has a dilemma. I said, what? He has a dilemma. What? And it dimed on me, dilemma. So you've got to learn their lingo. I asked one brother if he liked cr cricket. He said, I'm a fanatic. Well, I had already heard lunatic, so I knew that was a fanatic. Okay. All right, anybody have any questions about that real quick? All right, I'm going to have to hurry to get the rest of this in. I want to tell you very quickly why things are different. India is the only Hindu nation where this applies. There is one other Hindu nation in the world, and that country is Nepal, but things are not the same there because of other matters, mostly uh, economic and political. But Hinduism was something that was a merger of the religions of two different groups of people from what we call the Aryan philosophy, those people that came into India from ancient Persia and took over, and then also the aboriginal people of this area who are very dark-skinned people. And uh, just give it a pull, Karen, and I'll... Okay. And the aboriginal people were uh, the Dravidians. So anyhow, the uh, two different kinds of people got together and they had, uh, over a period of time, it just happened, formed a religion that does not have a definite date that it began, a definite place, a definite founder, or uh, a particular book that they go by to say this is what we believe. So none of that's true for Hinduism. It just kind of evolved. And so you've got that strange situation existing in the first place. Well. Because they wanted an orderly society, they developed a caste system. Every society has a caste system, unstated usually. Okay, If you look at the Jews in Jesus' time, the Pharisees and the scribes were high caste. They were too good for everybody else. They viewed themselves as what? Self-righteous. They were righteous. They were self-righteous, not really righteous before God. But they were too good for the other people. Look at how the Jews treated the Gentiles. Look at how the Jews treated the Samaritans, which was even worse, see? We've had problems in this country. Every nation has had problems over race and color. Every nation at one time or another, and it's still going on in the world. Well, it went on in India because the Portuguese came, and they were up and down this coast making, finding all these places to do business, establishing ports, and... They said casta because they saw this class kind of distinction among the Hindus. And the British came about 120 years later, and they saw the same thing, and they cut off the A and put an E on it to make it caste. So when you talk about the caste system, if you're going to spell it right, you've got to put the E on the end. So what is the caste system? And that's not what the people who originally came to India were, or the, the, the language of Sanskrit. 
which is the precursor of Hindu, uh, Hinduism, Hindi, and all these other uh, uh, languages. Sanskrit said varna, and varna meant color. So the darker your color, the lower you are on the totem pole. That's not right, and it's not fair, but that's what happened. So in the caste system, Hinduism has three distinct deities that they have as a triumvirate or a trinity. Brahma is the main god. He's the creator. Shiva, Vishnu, is the preserver. Shiva is the destroyer. Everything is cyclical. So from the head of Brahma came the Brahmins. That's the highest caste. They are the priests and the scribes and so on. From the upper arms and shoulders came the Kshatriyas. These are the rulers and the warriors and the uh, kings. From the thighs came the Vaishyas. These are the trades merchants. Mahatma Gandhi was a Vaishya. Okay? These three are all high caste. There is no middle caste. Okay? But there is one low caste, and that came from the feet of Brahma. These are the Sudras. Now, the Sudras mostly are farmers. And this is the biggest single group in India. Okay? So you have the Sudras, about 60% plus, and then beneath the feet of Brahma, those who do all the filthy, I mean really the filthy jobs that nobody else wants, are the untouchables. And what makes them untouchable is the filthy jobs they do. So it's a self-perpetuating problem. If you are born in a caste, you will die in a caste. There is nothing you can do to change your caste. Now, three things you have to believe to be a Hindu. You have to believe in Dharma and Karma. Pardon me, Dharma, reincarnation, Karma. Dharma is a... Pardon? Yeah, that's what I was talking yeah. about. You know, reincarnation, that's part of the Hindu religion to a certain degree. Or, oh, or, great or, deal, yeah. yeah. So Dharma is a code of ethics or righteousness you have to live by in order to be saved, to achieve moksha. Did you understand moksha, brother? It means salvation. All right. So you want to be saved? This is how you have to live. Now, that's your dharma. So you're up at this level. You die, because you're not going to get it right the first time, and you're, re you're reincarnated, you're recycled. And you come back, and your next life, based on your dharma in your past life, determines your karma. In other words, if your dharma was here, and you live a wicked life, when you come back, you're going to have bad karma. You go down. If you live a good life, you're going to have good karma and you're going to go up. So it's a cause and effect relationship. You live a sinful life and you pay the price for it, but you're going to have to go through hundreds, possibly thousands of lifetimes to get this right. Okay? Now, who wants to do that? Because if you're an untouchable, you're going to have to come back hundreds and hundreds of times and hopefully work your way up to finally you get into the low caste variety when you come back the next time. And then you're going to have to go through hundreds, maybe thousands of lifetimes before you finally become a caste Hindu. How attractive is that to you when you know when you're in the untouchable or the low caste, you're going to be, most of the time, by far, a poor person. In fact, the poorest of the poor. Oh, doesn't sound, sound thrilling to you? Hinduism, you know, in this country, people, oh man, that's really neat. No, it's not neat. It's it's oppressive. It is a religion without hope. It has nothing to look forward to except more drudgery and trouble. And so I don't understand the fascination except it gets away from Christianity, i.e. responsibility to God. That's what that's called. Uh -huh. No, they're, that's a good question. They're about 13% are Muslim. But fortunately they're Sunni. And they are the ones who are more laid back. So we don't have, and I think personally that now those who claim to be Christians has overstepped that. In other words, I think we're past the, the Muslims and because of things that are going on. Now, how much more time we got? Oh, I need more than that. <laughs> okay, so here's what happens. Uh, these people, are, because of that, are bailing out by the millions. By the millions, they are leaving Hinduism. And where are they going? Well, one study says, the Joshua Project said since the year 2000, the number of people who are becoming believers in Christ in India is growing at an exponential rate. In other words, you can't count them. Some becoming Buddhist, some are becoming Muslim, most of them becoming believers in Jesus Christ. And we have no way to give you a definite number, 
The lowest number we've heard per day is 7,000, and that's only a little over 2,600,000 people. I believe it's a lot more than that, that's, but, you know, that's my feeling, all right? Now, here's how the American has a, an important role in the work in India. I go over there, and I have, this is the R situation, okay? A-A-A-R-E-E. -A, -A, -E -E. a, we are angels from God because we have come with a Bible in our hands. The first to do that were the British, and that's what people felt about them, and they still do when we go. Number two, I'm an American. Nobody loves Americans more than the people of India. Nobody. Number three, I am therefore an authority figure, and I mean carry a lot of weight. You don't have to be a big man to carry a lot of weight in India if you're from the United States, if you're, if you're American and, you know, and an angel from God. R is respect that this engenders. And so we're respected by these people. I mean, you know, if Chuck came in late for worship service, would all of you stand up because he came in late? They do for me. <laughs> I got Chuck on that one. Now, and, and that's a very humbling thing, really. But that's what they do. And the older I get, the more that happens. The other thing, E, nobody's better educated than an American. I don't believe that's true anymore, but that's their view of it. And so we're educated Americans. We are respected because we're angels of God and Americans and so on and authority figures. And the other thing is that we are experts. You know what an expert is? An expert is someone 50 miles from home with a briefcase in his hand. There's a lot of truth to that. And because of that, all of that together, when I go hold a gospel meeting, let's say that you're a denominational preacher and Andy's been, Adam has been teaching you for some time and you have not allowed anybody from the church inside. Now, you're teaching what Andy's teaching you to your church, but nobody like me or him, Adam, has been to your church. But now, oh, here's an American. Would you, you go to him and you say, would you like to have an American come to your church? And he said, yeah, because you know what that's going to do? Make you look real big. Makes you look big, too. So, so I come in there, and I'm the authority figure and all this other stuff. They pay attention to what I have to say. I'm the icebreaker for the first time from an outsider, from the Church of Christ, they're going to hear about how to become a Christian and what the church is about. Now, let's say that this has gone on for some time, and every man in here has been to teach at your church, and these people are believing it. You may have already been baptized. What happens now? I go there, and I'm the cleanup man. The bases are loaded. My job is to knock it out of the park because I'm substantiating, validating what they've already learned. So that's how that works. Now, I can tell you a lot more, but folks, I'm telling you, because of Hinduism and the concept of reincarnation and the caste system that is so oppressive, people are bailing out in India by the boatloads, and we need to be there to teach them the gospel, and that's part of what's happening. Now, last year, last year, this is 35 years' worth of work. We didn't get here overnight. We have a huge team. We've got about 25,000 Indian preachers. That's a lot of preachers. They are doing most of the work by far. I'll be the first to tell you that. I have my role. See, If Chuck came over, he would have a definite place in that same thing. But what happens is, because of their respect and all of that, and the authority figure, almost apostolic, it really makes a big difference. And so we're able to reach these people. And last year we had 260,000 plus Gospel meetings. Those are one-day meetings. You may have one, two, three, four, even five speakers. And we baptized 1.94 people per meeting. That means we baptized 506,000 people last year. Never have we come close to that before. But when you spend money to send people out, and if you know the Bible says his word will not return to him void, and we need to sow the seed, we're sending these men out, and they're doing the work, and I preach a lot in India when I'm there, and when we have these meetings, we're going to have some kind of response. Many times the, the, the numbers they bring back are zero, one, and two, sometimes three. But when I go, it's more for the reasons I've already told you, okay? But they've been taught. It's not like I'm going to a fresh place. If I go to a place they've never heard it before, sometimes we don't baptize anybody. But when those people have been taught for some time, I'm the one who helps push them across the line. So that's how it works. And we're out of time.
But if you have more questions, I'll try to answer those. We have a display of things from India back there. Karen and I will tell you more about that. We need to get some things out of the way, so yeah. Thank you very much. We'll take a break. <laughs>